All right, everyone. So for our last day of the class, one of the big things we're going to talk about now is JSON, J-S-O-N, J uh, JavaScript Object Notation. I left you last time with a quick look at json.org or .com or whatever it is. Let's take a look at it a little bit deeper, that website, if you haven't had a chance to look at it. I just mentioned it last time, but today we'll look at it a little bit deeper, understand what we're talking about, and then actually get it to work. JSON.org, JSON, JavaScript Object Notation. This is a, a modern, well, let's see what, how they define it, is a lightweight data interchange format. Uh, it's easy for humans to read and write. It is easy for <coughs> machines to parse and generate. It's based on the subject of JavaScript programming language. Um, JSON is a text format that is completely language independent but uses conventions that are familiar to programmers of the C family uh, of languages including C, C++, C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, Perl, Python, and many. These properties make JSON an ideal data interchange language. Uh, so the big idea about this is that it is a way to describe data, to describe content, to group content. Hey, that sounds like a database. Now a traditional kind of database like MySQL, Oracle, SQL, uh, what else? FoxPro, um, you know, other kinds of databases. They they rely on a very complex system in that there's a whole you know. Uh, server and operating system and uh, you need a whole structure and hardware and software to get it to run and then you have data in a database and the database is just a collection of information text information graphic information picture information but nowadays a modern app needs some kind of database because without it it's going to be static the the app will always be the same with a database we can save data retrieve data uh, and that's a modern, a modern web app or a modern mobile app. Uh, creating data, retrieving data, deleting data, etc. Updating data. There's many ways to do this. And so because our project is a website at heart, um, we, we would think, well, what about if we use, you know, MySQL, which is a very popular database in, in, the, modern, in the modern web. The problem with MySQL is that it needs to be installed on a server. So if you've got a website, a web app that's run, running on a server, you've got a server to run the database, MySQL. Oftentimes then you use PHP to interface with it. You've got your, your app, you've got the database. In the middle, there's sort of a middleman there, PHP. Your <coughs> HTML file uh, uses PHP to connect with the MySQL database pulls data out of the database, PHP processes it, puts it back into the HTML file. That works fine for a web app. Ours is no longer a web app. It's, it's an app on a mobile device. And these cool little things are mini computers in our pockets, but they're not exactly the sort of you know, computers that you run a real website on. They, they don't exactly have you know, a server backend. You don't really install MySQL on these. You don't, you don't use PHP on them directly. You can still access all of that stuff off on a server. If uh, we've got our app and we program it, we can connect over to our GoDaddy server, our Bluehost server, our Amazon server, whatever. We can connect to a server, have it do server stuff, and pull the data back into our, our, our device. But the operative word is server. So how many of you own or have access to a server? So very few people at the moment here. Um, so. An alternative is, well, is there a way for us to maybe sort of implement these, these databases and such locally without relying on a server? And that's going to be PouchDB when we get to that, a way to make a database that exists on the device, which then could be replicated over to a, a, a server. Before we get to that, PouchDB is based on the concept of JSON, JavaScript Object Notation, because it's become this standard. I mentioned it previously when you create a Twitter app and you have it interface with the Twitter database, it can give you data back in JSON format. Uh, this has really become the standard. Every, every website and every service out there really 
wants you know wants to work with you usually via JSON format, uh, pulling data out in JSON, saving stuff to the database in JSON format. It's just a way to ch uh, interchange data from one thing to another. So it behooves us to understand exactly what it is and how it works. Um, JSON is built on a collective name and value pair. In various languages, this is realized as an object or a record or a struct or a dictionary or hash table, whatever they want to call it, keyed list or associative array. So if you've dealt with any databases in other languages, maybe a couple of those ring a bell, associative arrays and such objects. We've talked about objects in this class and previous class in several different, different times. Um, and then an ordered list of values. So some sort of name and some sort of value. Or you could also call it a key pair value. Something and something. An ordered list of values. In most languages, this is realized as an array, vector, list, or sequence. So I've got a database in MySQL, let's say, uh, of all of my customers. So a database of customers. And in there, I've got records for John and Janet and Bill and Juan and everyone. And then on each one of those, it has several things that further define the record. Uh, Juan is this age, that income, and this height. And Bill is this, and that, and this. But each one of those exists in the database. We can retrieve it, we can update it, we can delete it. But that requires the whole overhead of a, of a, of a server and such. So JSON is basically, you've got a value, you've got a key, and a value. The key is name. The value is Juan. The key is name. The value is Victor. The key is uh, name. The value is Janet. So pairs of information. Um, there's an interesting schematic here about how it actually is sort of defined. Object, array, value, and all of that. It's, it's kind of very, you know, techie the way they're explaining it, but it, it really does explain it here really well. Um, so basically, JSON is defined with curly brackets. A JSON object is curly brackets, very similar to what we know already with JavaScript. Let's say we have function get name. Don't we define it then as curly brace, close curly brace with a bunch of code in the middle? So that construct is there already from JavaScript. Inside of that object, curly brace and curly brace, we have some string, a colon, and a value. That's very reminiscent of, of, um, of like CSS. We have h1, well, think of it like this, h1, color, red. Right, the whole h1 object, the heading 1 object, has um, the string of color, and then the value of red, or yellow, or pink, or purple. The p tag object, the p object, has a string of width, colon, 99 pixels. We've seen this idiom already. Keys and values, strings and values. Uh, this defines that. And we can have multiple ones then separated with commas. So the way it's showing you here is we've got curly braces, we have name, colon, John, comma, name, colon, Bill, comma, name, colon, Janet, comma, as many objects as we want, as many pairs as we want in the object, that is. So basically, this is the schematic for the database. Everything in the curly brackets is the database. You say, okay, well, if that works great with names and numbers, how does that work with pictures and videos and all of that? Pictures and videos are just references to objects on a server. I've got a video saved in a folder called videos. So I have an object here, and then it says video, uh, well, the whole object is, is video, but it's got name, cat, comma, path, C drive, slash, uh, videos, slash, cats, comma, name, dogs, um, comma, path, C drive slash docs. So the actual data of the video could be stored in the object here, but usually it's a reference 
to an object in some folder somewhere on the server or in the app. So that's how we can reference any kind of data, text, video, audio, and all of that. We could technically put the raw data of that picture into the, the object as well. Remember when we worked with the camera, there was uh, get picture dot data URI or something. And what that did was it put the raw data of the, of the picture, you know, uh, letters and numbers that define the actual data of the picture. That could then be stored in the, in the JSON object, which of course is redundant because object is already there. JSON object object. Um, so this can hold strings, numbers, objects, arrays, booleans, null, and so forth. And sometimes, let's say we've got um, a database that has a collection of company names. And um, the name of the company includes quotes. Well, the tricky thing is that we often put quotes around these things anyway, because a string is usually quotes. So that gets us into that issue, and what I'm saying is, you know, when we get to this, we're going to have something that says store colon John's Bakery. This is one object in the database. Store colon um, Victor Treats. This, this is Jason right here. We're going to write it ourselves in a moment. This is Jason. It's an object because we've got the curly brackets. We've got one item in the database, basically. Comma, another item, comma, another item, comma. Very, very, very basic. It's just, you know, human readable, human created. But the, the way you do it, notice the syntax of it. One moment. What I was getting at about this here, about these values, is that sometimes you need special characters, so here it's telling you you're going to have to escape them. So the, the quote right here is actually going to break things. It's going to think, oh, you ended the quote. So in that case, we'd have a backslash. Um, so we'll see that when we actually do it. But this, this page here is just trying to tell you, here's the basic concepts, here's how you can use it, a bunch of resources to keep learning it, and um, We'll do it together ourselves in a moment. Question? Is it possible to have more than one database? Yeah. The Definitely. We can have as many as we want. Basically, is uh, as far as the limitation of the device's space. Uh, so, you know, if we don't use up all the, all the user's memory card, we can have as many databases as we want. All right, so to actually kind of practice with this, what I've got is we're going to do an activity where we're going to practice creating JSON objects, creating JSON data, and then uh, pulling data out of it um, to display. Let me show you the end result, and then we'll then I'll give you the starting point. The end result. It's going to be super basic, but it always helps to just be basic to focus. We're going to have a website with a button. You click the button, it loads up a picture, uh, some text, and a link. You click it again, it gives you another random social network. Click another one, another one, and another one, and another one. That is pulling stuff out of the database. That is pulling out the picture the name of the social network, the link to the social network, three pieces of data that define one social network. This social network is defined by its picture, its name, and its link. That's a database. And then we're using some JavaScript to click on the button and pull one out of the database randomly. We could, of course, pull one out exactly the one we want, but for fun, we're doing it randomly. So I've got some starting files for us to work with. I've got the pictures, and that's, and that's it. I've got the pictures and jQuery. And then we'll do it all from scratch uh, to get a good understanding. So if you go to the network folder, let's go ahead and go to Classroom Data, the network folder, Campus Android 2. You're going to see a folder called JSON Practice 1 Start. 
I'll give you the end version in a little bit, but here's our start. Copy the whole folder to your desktop or flash drive. Copy that start file. That start folder. And what's inside the folder are the pictures and jQuery. So we've got the jQuery library there so that we can write less, do more. We don't we typically don't need anything to get up and running with, with JSON. That's the cool thing about it. We don't need a server, we don't need any sort of library, we don't need anything. It's just such a basic construct that anything can use it and understand it. I have here jQuery simply for us to be able to write some code quickly rather than the whole long rigmarole of document dot get element by id blah 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 we just type dollar sign button and that's it so these are uh, nine pictures of social media networks they're all uniformly designed and sized and such doesn't have to be but just for the design of this project they all are and they're all named very basically they could be named Uniquely, they're named sequentially. Make a note of that. Although these can be named anything, of course, but I name this sequentially so that it can help us retrieve them randomly. We'll see how in a moment. So, in your project folder, your start folder, on an empty spot, right click, new text document, and let's call that JSON, J S O N. Practice with your initials .html. Take out the txt and we'll rename that over to html. Confirm when it complains about changing the extension. Just go ahead and let it change over to html. Basically, we're cr creating a blank html document. We're going to use Notepad in a moment, so obviously we could have opened Notepad, new file, save file. But here's a quick way under Windows. Create a new document, save it as html confirm that you want to change it to HTML and then open it in, Note, in Notepad. So we have a blank HTML document. We haven't done it in a while but let's get some practice of building that very very basic HTML5 compliant document. Remember we did that a while ago? Let's brush off those cobwebs. Remember, we'll write the doc type, HTML, HTML pairs, that head, body. In the head, we want the meta tag, car set, UTF-8. Uh, title will do JSON practice. And in the body, we'll just do a quick h1, my JSON practice, whatever. So create something like that, 10, 10 quick lines, and we'll get started. So I'm done. Are you? No. A couple more seconds. <laughs> That's right. And a keyboarding class in high school. <laughs> or maybe uh, maybe Mavis Beacon teaches typing. You know what? That she was in help for me. My typing teacher wrote in my yearbook, I hope you enjoy using your typing like you enjoy using it. Mm. <laughs> Hopefully it's come true. Yes,
well, that's just uh, like my JSON, like, uh, you know, you always see iPod or iPhone or i this, i that. I'm just using my sort of like for. Oh, because I'm using like MySQL. So they're not related. Oh, uh, <laughs> no. No, I don't, I don't think the MySQL really means anything, but it might simply be like that. My, like me, that sort of thing. SQL is structured query language, and you know, it's an older it's an older way to create databases. And then the new version of it for the modern web is MySQL. So I don't know. They just chose a name, friendly, I guess. And here we've called our app MySDCE simply again, like to make it personable. That's the name of our app, so that when someone enrolls in the college, it's you know, it's my college, MySDCE. Here I just thought of that and plugged it in. All right, so 10 lines here. What we want to do now is add the reference over to uh, jQuery. We've got the jQuery library in the folder, right? We added, um, I, I gave you the jQuery uh, JavaScript file there simply so that we can create, so we can write some JavaScript code faster and more effectively. So we need to reference that library in our code. Let's add it. Um, let's add it uh, where we've usually added our JavaScript. So right after, right after heading one, before the end of body, we're going to write the script tag. Open, close, script tags. And uh, we need to add the attributes to the opening script tag um, of src, source, the name of our JavaScript library, which is the file right there. So jQuery-2.2.1. min.js. So opening and closing script <coughs> tags, where we are referencing an external JavaScript library. Make sure you type that properly. Um, that's what we've got in our folder. I forgot to check if that was the latest version of the code. Doesn't matter, but uh, that's the library we've got there. It should be the latest one. I pulled it out of our out of our main uh, out of our main app because remember we have a local copy of it in our in our app. Let's uh, let's back up to create a brand new line nine, and we're going to create a button. So again, very boring interface. It's just going to be a button that we click on, and it loads a picture. Uh, so we're not going to be able to do data roll page and all of that because that won't work since we don't have a reference to jQuery mobile anywhere in our code. <coughs> so data roll won't work, data icon won't work, all of that won't work. We don't have jQuery mobile. We only have jQuery. We only have jQuery. So let's create a simple button. We've got a tag for buttons. Since we won't be able to do href data roll equals button, we have a plain old HTML tag for buttons, the button tag, and we'll call the button choose your social network. It's kind of a big button, but sure, choose your social network. And we should be understanding that if we want to access content in the HTML, from the JavaScript, best practice is to name it with a class or an ID. We're going to use an ID here. Let's back up to button and add the ID attribute. We'll call this btn social. This is our button of social media. Save it and run it. You should just get a very simple button on screen. Open up the console just in case so that there isn't anything, any errors, you know. Load it up in Firefox, open your console, and check if there's if there's any errors. There shouldn't hopefully be any at this point.
BTN Social, which of course I've got a capital letter there, which matters when we reference it in the JavaScript. And notice there's no pound sign there. Hopefully you're getting used to that as well. No pound sign or dot when we name it in the HTML, but yes, pound sign or dot when we reference it in the JavaScript. Let me check my code to see what mine looks like so far. And then you want to open the console as well, F12. And I don't have any errors. Good so far. So that's what everyone should have at the moment. Is everyone on track? Anyone need a little help? <coughs> you can go up to, in Notepad, you can go up to Run, Launch Firefox. Or the handy keyboard shortcut, uh, Control, Alt, X. Control, Alt, Shift, X. Okay, so my concept is I've got a button, and when I click it, stuff will happen, and then that stuff will then display on screen. So let's create a placeholder to display the stuff. After our button, so add a new line 10, we'll create a basic div, basic div container. And in order for this to be referenced by the JavaScript code, we should also name it. So let's create a div, let's give it an ID. And we'll call it uh, div result. The way I'm naming these things, again, you can make up these IDs however you want. But I've got a button, and so when I look at my JavaScript, my hundreds of lines of JavaScript, let's say, now we got something that says BTN social. That should hopefully remind me, oh, I've attached this to a button somewhere. I've used it as a button somewhere. And I've got this div of, div of div result so that when I see that later on in my JavaScript, hopefully it triggers my memory that, oh, I must have some sort of div container where I'm displaying results. These things, these things can be called anything we want, of course. And that's what I'm using there. We're going to write some JavaScript now, and then to keep it um, some custom JavaScript, and to keep it um, easy, we're just going to write the JavaScript in this file. Obviously, we've uh, we've dealt with writing our own custom code, our own custom JavaScript in a in a JS file. That'll work just fine. I want to just keep it in this one file so it's all contained, and I can reference it again in the future. So after our jQuery script, let's create a new line twelve and start your script tags again, and this time break it into a couple of lines because I'm going to have a bunch of JavaScript in the middle of those. This JavaScript pair here is only used to reference the library. You do not want to reference a library and write JavaScript between the tags. That would be nice and save a little bit of extra bytes, but you don't want to do that. I don't believe it's valid code. So we need to create another JavaScript block, and in that block we create our custom JavaScript. The thing I want to do here, at the, at the least, is to make sure that the, um, the button works, as in that I click on it and it understands that I'm clicking on it. So inside of the JavaScript block, line 13, uh, we're going to do some jQuery here. Dollar sign parentheses dot on. Remember that. Some object with some trigger. Some object with some trigger. Some object with some method, technically. Remember we've talked again in JavaScript, we've got objects, object-oriented programming, JavaScript object notation, it's all coalescing. Some object, some method, some command to apply on the object basically. 
the particular object we're talking about, in the parentheses, in quotes, is the name of the button. Pound BTN social. Don't forget the pound sign there. So the easy way. In your JavaScript, you're going to use the pound or the dot. In your HTML, you won't. And what we've been doing several times is Then inside of the on method, we have the attribute click. Once the button is clicked, do something. And we've seen this several times. Function, open close parentheses, curly braces. This is an anonymous function. It's anonymous because other times when we've created a function, remember we, we write function, get name, and we define what get name is. Function, get camera, and we define what get camera is. Those are named functions. Just like we use the keyword var to create variables, we name the variable, we can name a function, we can create a function. This is an anonymous function. Um, we, we can simply create one on the spot here or invoke one. Uh, we're going to invoke one, we're going to call one, we're going to use one right now very quickly, just a plain old alert. We'll pop up some message. We'll say clicked. This is enough to check if everything is on track. This is enough to save it and run it, and for you to click on the button and get a pop up that says clicked, or whatever message you told it in the alert. So try that. Write this code, save it and run it. And see if you get a pop up. If you don't, double check. Well, number one, look at your console. And number two, <laughs> double check that your, uh, that your spelling is correct. <clears throat> check that your spelling is correct, because it is case sensitive. Let me see if mine works. Refresh it and open my console. I will click and it pops up clicked. And every time that I click it, it works. Here's my code so far. Anyone need any help? Thank <laughs> you. 
actually no idea.
Yeah, it's just in the wrong place, but just in the wrong location, so I can make All right, so at this point, we um, have a proof of concept that this works. When we click, something happens. We get an alert. But we've got a placeholder right here. That placeholder, in theory, is there to show stuff. Why are we making it pop up in an alert box? So what we'll do is we'll make that display in the um, in the alert box. I mean, in the in the div. So let's do this instead. We're going to uh, delete this this alert method. Uh, we're not going to make it alert anymore. We're going to make it display in this in this little box right here. A quick way to do it, this is not the best way, but here's just a quick way to do it, is, well, there's an object in the HTML. Let's reference it and let's change it. So when there's an object and we've got jQuery, we can reference it like this. That looks familiar. We did that for the button. When you have an object on screen that is named, we can reference it and do something with it, like when it's clicked. Now here we're saying the result of it being clicked is this function, which will be now, let's reference the, the div placeholder. What we will do is dot HTML. Let's write some HTML in that div. In quotes. Clicked. So instead of it popping up as an alert, let's make it say clicked on screen. We've got a placeholder there that is named, and therefore we can reference it right here and write some HTML <coughs> in that object. Let's see, go ahead and save and run that and see how that works. It will be slightly anticlimactic because you'll only see one result once. It'll be no div. You click it, and then it'll show clicked. And then if you click it multiple times, it will put di it'll put clicked again. But since you've done it once, it really shouldn't show up anymore. Clicked. And I click it, and it's still clicked. So now there's there's my update. some object on screen, put stuff in it. And then it's just clicked on screen when you click. You said it's really not the best way. It's, so it's not the best way. We should actually do what we've been doing for other parts of our project, where, which is that don't just rely on an, on an anonymous function. Create a function with all your steps. That's what we're about to do. Here I'm just showing that we can quickly use an anonymous function to do something which, you know, quick and dirty does it, but we need to do a lot of things. We need to access the database, pull out the picture, show the picture on screen, access the name, access the, access the, uh, the link, display it all on screen. So that's multiple steps I want to do. I'm going to put all of that, we're going to put all of that into a function, and then when we click the button, do all of those 20 steps instead of just one thing like that. So if this worked great, if it didn't, that's okay. I'm going to move on. It doesn't have to completely work just now, but it should. Uh, and if it doesn't work, it's because probably you misspelled something here. Make sure you've got a pound symbol right there. What I'm going to do is this line, so this might be valuable to you. This knowledge that I just gave you might be interesting. Yeah, I can do something very quick here. So what I'm going to do is copy and paste this line right after itself. I'm going to comment out one of the lines for myself, for the future, to remind myself this is a bit of code that might be useful. So what I mean is, line 13, copy it and paste it after itself on line 14. And then line 13, comment it out. Because we're actually going to change line 14 back to simply an anonymous function. So this is totally optional, you don't even have to do this, but I'm saying here, 
we can use an anonymous function for some quick results. Save it in your, save it by commenting it in case, <coughs> in case you want to use it later. And now we will actually do something for real here. We're going to call, we're going to invoke the function, we're going to run the function <coughs> get social. So instead, the big difference here is this anonymous function did one thing. I need to do many things. So we'll create a function and define all of those many things. And all those many things will run once the button is clicked. That means we need to define what does get social mean. So what we're going to do is create the definition of get social. Uh, we're going to do that before the button, simply because remember, it does matter the order of your code. That's why we're adding this JavaScript at the end, because what could happen is if we've got our JavaScript first, and in our JavaScript says, when you click a button, show, um, show something on screen, well, the app the operating system hasn't had a chance to create all of the objects yet, and now you're trying to use an object. We're trying to use this div before it's been created. If we put our script before the div, the div doesn't exist, and when I click, it'll say, what div? Because at that millisecond that the code <coughs> loaded up, there was no div at that moment. So that's why what we're doing is we're putting all our script after the HTML. Let the HTML exist first, and then let's do something with it. And what I'm saying now about the JavaScript, same sort of thing here. Um, the, um, the code here, I could be saying, let's click a button and let's do a bunch of steps. But those steps don't exist yet. So we're going to back up and create the function of what does getSocial mean. So that that's created and, and ready for us first. And then when we try to access getSocial, it exists. So I'm going to back up back to line 13, uh, and we'll write function space get social curly bra uh, parentheses curly brackets on two lines. And just to see that this is working, I'm going to copy that result code into the get social just to see that I, if I didn't mess anything up. Save it and run it, and it should again, when you click the button, display clicked on screen. This is another way to do the same thing I did here, but more powerful. Let's pause here, save it and run it, make sure that when you click the button, it says clicked on screen. If it doesn't, now stop me, because it should work now, or it won't as we go forward. So check that it does show clicked on screen when you click the button. Yes. Technically, it doesn't matter, but you often see it in tutorials that they do put it there. So if you put it or not, it shouldn't matter, but technically it doesn't need it. Let's see if mine works. Open the console just in case. Click it, and it says clicked on screen. So it should do the same thing that it did previously, but now we're setting ourselves up to be more complex. All right, so that work for everyone? Are we ready to go on?
also what's in the All right, so here we've got this basic structure for for uh, now we've got a button that is allows us to be interactive and then we're gonna have a bunch of or all of the magic basically happening in get social this will connect to a database look in the database for a random social network and out of that pull out those three pieces of data picture name link and display them on screen all of those operations that will be in that function at this point, if it's working great, we're ready to get started. Let's take our first break. When we come back, then we'll talk about, okay, let's build a JSON database. Let's build a JSON object to display, to store our database stuff. It's 7.06. Let's take a 10-minute break. We'll be back at 7.16, and we'll go on. I'm going to put my code in the network folder if you'd like it, but I think everyone's works so 